Thank you, all of you who have uh, led us this morning in worship through song. We're going to be spending a few weeks on what is considered by many to be their favorite, not only psalm in the Bible, but their favorite uh, chapter in all of the scriptures. Psalm 23. And as we begin our study, we're going we're gonna to look at these um, much more closely. Instead of just doing a kind of uh, sweeping overview in one week, we're going to take time over each verse and ponder more deeply the specifics of what's being shared that helps us understand why this is so powerful. And as we begin this um, focus study, let's look at the entire psalm together. I'll read aloud as you follow along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Uh, a friend of mine was talking with me the other day about a neighbor of his named Claudine, and I'm assuming because he's a gracious person that that's not her real name, so don't start working through the uh, card file catalog of uh, your friends to know if this is your neighbor. But uh, a neighbor of his named Claudine, whose face was always set in a mask of discontent. You may know people like that. There is just something about being with them. If you were to ask them, are you happy? They would say, oh, of course, I'm happy. Um, he actually one time said to her, well, um, tell your face. Um, he said he, for, for years he had... Um, Seen her out his uh, kitchen window, she would uh, be watering in her garden, she would be carrying in her groceries or talking to her children and couldn't help but notice a deep frown of permanent kind of um, earnestness on her face. Her mouth was set in a long hard line that rarely carved, um, curved into a smile. And... Um, they were visiting one time outdoor, and um, she started talking about these aspects of her life. Uh, the house was attractive but needed paint, and her husband was too lazy to paint it. Her kids, polite, good students, but um, too like her in-laws, she said. The weather was nice, but uh, if all the sunshine keeps up, we're going to have a drought. She always found a way. She was Debbie Downer. Um, and and here's, what, here's what he said. He said, Claudine was unable to enjoy, any, enjoy anything fully because there was always a fly in the ointment. Um, I don't know if you know anyone like that. Or if this morning you're having to confront in yourself that tendency to always add a sour note to every tune. If so, this uh, beginning point for our study in Psalm 23 is an invitation into a different possibility. The, tr the truth is our culture promotes the feeling that what we have is never enough. The key to our happiness, according to Madison Avenue marketeers, is one more telephone, a slightly nicer car, a bigger home, clothes more in keeping with our true regal status. There is always something more that we need to have if we're going to be happy. Head off to the Bahamas, we're told. Pamper yourself with rich food. Become the epitome of a well-dressed man or woman. Well, there's always something more. And until we get that, we are struggling with insatiable desires, unmet wants and supposed needs. Um, 
what we say we want, what we desperately must have, sometimes knows no limit. And the, the result is a population explosion of restless strivers, obsessed with what we lack, consumed by our compulsion to consume. And sadly, even when people get what they say they want, their supposed sources of satisfaction fail to appease their appetites, slake their thirsts. Psalm 23 invites us into a different world, a different kind of experience. And as we listen to the human side of an intimate conversation between one believer and God, we hear a welcoming invitation into a different way of experiencing the world we already inhabit, an invitation into a world without want. Says David, the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Psalm 23 is a timeless classic, is it not? It stands out among the psalms, and it is, a, it, it, it is rightly understood to be a source of encouragement and consolation that has supported believers for millennia. It is a psalm of trust, well put. And um, there are many of the psalms that are designed for the people of God together to sing um, so that it's about we and our. But the psalms of trust are designed as more intimate encounters between a single person of faith and the great God. And the intimacy of a psalm of trust is part of what makes it so alluring, so captivating. Psalm of trust in this regard invites us to join David in a personal expression of our gratitude and our confidence in God. And the focal image at the outset of the psalm is of a shepherd watching over much beloved flock, beloved flock of sheep. And it's really appropriate, is it not, that we would have this psalm from David, the shepherd king. The picture captivates us today, despite the fact that few of us really have any direct experience with sheep. How many of you tended sheep at some time in your life? I know there are some, yeah. Okay, I want to confess at this point, uh, the sheep I have known through the years uh, have really not been very good friends. They've just been acquaintances on the side of the road as I drive by in a car. I'm not an expert, but I know how to do research. And so I've learned all these fascinating things about sheep. Those of you who actually have personal experiences with sheep can let me know afterwards whether I'm right or wrong. But would you reserve your comments until after this, <laughs> the sermon is over? <clears throat> um, the people of Israel were nomadic people. We know that. It's also worth noting that, um, that their economy depended on sheep in no small part. The, the world into which the psalmist speaks is a world that the people who first heard the psalm would have known, would have understood extremely well. It would have been a part of their livelihood and their daily existence, integrated into their cultural lives. On any given day, flocks of sheep could be seen grazing on the hillsides outside the fortified cities of Palestine or following their shepherds along rugged pathways from one feeding spot to another. And so, not surprisingly, the imagery of sheep and shepherds can be found all the way through the scriptures, Old Testament to New. For one thing, uh, God's messengers were often compared to uh, we're, we're often comparing the people of God to sheep. For instance, just here's from Psalm 100. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Um, for God's chosen people, this picture language accented their dependence, their vulnerability, their tendency to wander the ease with which they could be led and with which they could be misled. 
The political and religious leaders of the people of God were called to serve as shepherds of a sort, of this flock, the people of God. And more often than not, when we find references to that in the Bible, these leaders were falling short of their duty, were being called under judgment by a God who wanted something better from them, but they had failed at their calling, at the mandate that came for being who they were. The hopes of Israel ultimately were tied to a Messiah who would fulfill the full intentions of this sacred trust. Which brings us to Jesus, does it not? And it's not an accident that as we move into the New Testament and look for those images of sheep, we hear Jesus himself gathering the long history of tradition into his use of the same images. He felt compassion for the crowds that followed him because they were, he said, like sheep without a shepherd. He saw his mission as a mandate to seek out the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in a passage reminiscent of Psalm 23 itself, he actually described himself as the good shepherd, giving his life for the sheep, protecting them, leading them, calling them by name. And by identifying himself as the good shepherd, Jesus pointed to his oneness with the number one shepherd of all. Who is who? God. God the great shepherd. God above all others was the shepherd of the people of God. And we would affirm today God is the shepherd of God's people. We are his sheep. To experience God as shepherd, let, let's don't pass by that without appreciating how profoundly important that notion is. To experience God as shepherd is to put God's transcendence, God's holiness, God's glory, God's sometime distance as the great Lord above all in an utterly new light. The God of the burning bush was a fearfully holy God. You don't snuggle up to that kind of God. It's a good way to get burned, right? The God behind the temple veil evoked terror as much as praise. The high priest could only go in there once a year, and they actually tied ropes to the ankles of the high priests. Lest when they went in, if they weren't truly purified, they might be struck dead, and no one was going to go in to get them out. You needed a rope to pull out the corpse. You don't snuggle up to that kind of God. As shepherd, God is seen as something more than the terrified Lord above all lords. God is seen as loving and protective. God high and lifted up is also God who is close and dear. The psalmist is suggesting that if we want to understand God, we should spend some time considering the characteristics of a good shepherd. And in that regard, again, to, to fully appreciate what's happening here, just right there in verse, verse 1. It's worth our noting that whereas in much of our culture, sheep are raised to be slaughtered for meat, that was not standard practice in the Near East. I can't speak for today, but I know in the biblical era, um, and in much of the world still it is true, the sheep were reared for their wool. And your goal is to keep them alive as long as you can. And because of that, the shepherds and the sheep developed a special kind of relationship over time. The shepherds actually were investing their lives in the sheep for the long haul. They watched over them diligently. They knew almost instinctively when one was missing because they knew each sheep individually and by name. They took great care to see that they were adequately fed and rested. They risked their lives to protect them. And there were risks out there they needed to protect them from. An intimate bond developed before them, I, between them. I actually read a story that I was fascinated by 
a shepherd who in an interview was describing their lives there in the Middle East um, and how during the course of the day at various points in time each of the sheep would find their way to step out of line and come up individually to that shepherd to be nuzzled, scratched, and loved a little bit. It was this personal daily ritual of affection that took place between them. I, I, I find that um, fascinating to consider. None of those sheep, as big as the herds, as big as the crowd, was a matter of insignificance or unimportance to them. Does that register at all for you personally as it relates to God? It is easy for us in our world to think of ourselves as lost in the crowd and out on our own, having to figure out our way. Verse 1 of this text reminds us of God's intimate interest in you. God's intimate interest in me. It doesn't matter how big the crowd, it doesn't matter how small we may feel. God knows us by name and knows our needs. And out of that deep affection and that covenant commitment in love is looking out for our needs. We are not alone. That, that kind of affectionate care can be seen in the biblical images of good shepherds. They led. They kept their sheep from scattering. They guided. They sought the lost. They saw that their sheep were fed. Whether rescuing them from harm or tending to their scrapes and wounds, they exhibited strength and gentleness born of love. This is the pattern for God. It means that God's infinite power is harnessed for our protection and care. The psalmist, David, could easily speak back through the history of Israel to call on reminders over time about how God had been near in times of need. For the nation of Israel had developed a long catalog of the care of God. And it was codified in written scripture, we have it before us to know those stories. But there's more going on in this psalm than just a recitation from the past. As it has to do with the nation's history. What David is offering is a personal story about his own intimate acquaintance with the goodness of God. David had his experience of how God had cared for him. And I love how one of the interpreters of, um, of Psalm 23 put it as he described what was going on here in the psalm and why it is so rich and so powerful for us. Arthur Weiser writes, The sentiments of an almost childlike trust which the poet is able to express in this psalm are by no means the product of a carefree, unconcerned characteristic of young people. On the contrary, they are the mature fruit <clears throat> of a heart which, having passed through many bitter experiences and having fought many battles, had been allowed to find at the decline of life in its intimate communion with God the serenity of a contented spirit, peace of mind, and in all dangers, strength. The one who wrote, I shall not want, was saying, I'm filled I'm satisfied. My needs have always been met, and they will be met in the future, too. And clearly, contentment and confidence lie at the heart of this psalm. Past, present, future, all woven together in a seamless statement of assurance. What we get here is more than what have you done for me lately. And I think it also has to be said that what we get here is more than the kind of naive, blithe, passing off of the details of the real world as, as if, you know, the only way you can affirm these things is to ignore the fact that there are hungry people in the world. There are people living in danger. There are people who are dying. And there are big questions that get raised when we move into psalms like this and consider our experiences in a world where not everybody gets off scot-free. But I think it's 
it's valuable to, um, to note that, um, that even in the midst of this real world, this song has buoyed up the people of God over time. That you don't have to ignore the harsh realities of deprivation and death, of a stomach-churning desire for food that is not there, or for clothing that could keep one warm. There is still even here uh, good news and hope and comfort and encouragement that God is not ignoring these needs, that there is provision for us in all circumstances. In, in a book uh, by Donita Dyer entitled Pearl, she tells the story of an Armenian woman of faith, Pearl Kashishian, who lives through severe persecutions in Tur Turkey. Leaves her home town in a small village in Turkey, experiences life-threatening want and miraculous provision on her escape across the desert of central Turkey, and finally settles in the United States, her promised land. Years later, as her husband of 65 years lays dying, he asks her, what's she going to do after his death? It's just that kind of moment where you could say, gosh, is God even going to be there for me? And here's how she answers him. She holds his hand, and she replies with a reassuring voice, it won't be the same, but God is good, George. Remember how he protected me during the massacre and brought me safely to America? Surely you can trust him to take care of me now. Isn't that the place we need to find in our place? In our, in our places in life? In those stressful moments when we're pressed against the edges to be able to say, oh, the litany I can share of the provisions of God across time. The one who's cared for me up to this point, won't he more still be present for me now? The Apostle Paul, in his own way, affirmed the same thing when talking to uh, Christians from Philippi who had sent him uh, material provisions, and he expresses gratitude to them but wants them to understand that he wasn't anxious. He says, I've, I've learned how to abound. I've learned how to suffer want. I've learned in all things there to be content. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. That's the assurance of this psalm. The psalm doesn't pretend that all of life is easy. Neither does it promise provision without perspiration. What it offers is freedom from fretfulness. The assurance that come what may, God is present and is reaching out to care. We don't have to do these things alone. We don't have to feel like it's all up to us. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that we are living in a fear-saturated culture right now. And an awful lot in our lives is built around fear. And behind that also is this, this um, culture of scarcity. There's not enough. And we've got to compete for the little bit of limited resources so that there are going to be the haves and the have-nots and we've got to be among the haves and that kind of clamoring anxiety causes us to become enemies to one another and what Psalm 23 is saying to us is God offers up the culture of abundance and says I have all that you will ever need and more if instead of grasping, clinging, reaching, competing, pushing, shoving, despising, if you can simply come into my endless provisions, there will be enough for you, there will be enough for all. You can relax your tight grip, receive with gratitude, release with generosity and joy, this is the economy of Psalm 23. So, um, God wants us to relax. God wants us to experience contentment. 
And um, let me end with just some practical things. Would it be helpful to have just some therefores? If God is the God of all provision who loves us with intimate care, therefore, try these things on for size. First, evaluate your hungers. Take some time today to reflect and ask yourself, how important are they really? I wonder in that regard if we could quit saying, I'm starving is there anybody in this room who's starving? How important are these hungers? How important are these wants and needs when measured against your true needs and the priorities and values of the kingdom of God? A parenthetical note here, and I don't want to belabor it lest you think I talk about money all the time, but money is one of those places where we really get to test whether we're grasping, cleaning, or practicing a faith. God invites us to be generous toward the church, and toward the causes of good in the world, not only for those causes, but for us. And one of the best things we can do as an act of defiance against the culture of scarcity and the messages that start playing in our head is to open up our fist and let go. To practice generosity as an act of faith that is liberating from the things that choke out life and faith in us. Here's another idea. Cultivate a sense of the presence of God. Take time each day to relax. There are some of you, you've already told me, who feel guilty when you sit down. Who are on the go from the time you wake up until you fall asleep. And some of you are living half exhausted. Um, did you know that the first day of human existence, the first full day of human existence, was day seven? And what did God do on day seven? Rested. It's not an accident that the story of humanity begins with rest. God invites us to start with the restful sense of God's provision and to bask in the wonder and to use it as a time for meditation, centering, like our worship this morning has invited us to do, to be present to the provisions of God, to the presence of God, to the goodness and love of God, and to be swelled in the joy of that confidence. Here's another idea. Practice gratitude. Remember how God has provided for your major and minor needs. In contrast with, um, with that neighbor, Claudine, who can always find some way that the realities fall short. How about twisting that around and when you start feeling the gripes, pause and say, hmm, what have I to be grateful for today? Um, it may take a little priming of the pump to get started, but once you do, you'll find that you'll know no end to the ways you can express gratitude sincerely. Another, Consciously shift the focus of your thoughts away from yourself and your needs onto God and God's provisions. Allow yourself to be distracted by the greatness and the goodness of God. And then finally this. Claim Psalm 23 like prescription medicine. Uh, you, you, you may have one of those pill deals that you open each day to keep track of all your pills. Add one more pill in there. And um, the pill is Psalm 23.1. Put it in there. When you pop that open each day, pull it out. Take it. Just, it's not a hard verse to remember. Let's, let's try it on together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's do it again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will confess to you that my faith is simple in this way. I find that when I repeat truth like this 
over and over again. It changes the barometric pressure of the room. It lowers my pulse. It lowers my blood pressure. It centers me in God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Try that on for size, and uh, it may well prove that the best way indeed is this way. To follow it, live as if it were true, and discover how true it really is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's a reason we love this psalm, isn't there? Not just because it sounds good, but because it is good, and it is true. Amen.